NASA just announced that the San Andreas Fault, one of the most dangerous fault lines in the world, has just cracked. And now, something terrifying is about to happen. While some details are not precise yet, one sure thing is that it will be catastrophic. What's about to happen? When will it happen? Well, buckle up folks and prepare for shocking updates leaving you on the edge of your seat. For those who are not familiar, let us take a quick geography and history lesson on the San Andreas. The San Andreas Fault is a massive geological fault zone in California, USA. It's an incredibly significant area that runs for about 800 miles that's 1,300 kilometers through the state, passing through major cities such as Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Sacramento. The fault is responsible for numerous historical seismic events, including the infamous 1906 San Francisco earthquake that caused widespread damage and claimed thousands of lives. The San Andreas Fault is a transform fault, meaning the two plates move horizontally past each other. The Pacific Plate is slowly moving northwest relative to the North American Plate, at a rate of approximately 1 to 2 inches per year. This movement results in a buildup of stress along the fault, which can be suddenly released during an earthquake. The 1906 San Francisco earthquake is one of the most infamous events associated with the San Andreas Fault. It caused widespread destruction, with an estimated 80% of the city's buildings destroyed or damaged. The earthquake killed an estimated 3,000 people and remained one of the deadliest natural disasters in US history. Since the San Andreas Fault is a pretty active tectonic plate boundary, you'd expect to see some landscape evolution tied to fault displacement, right? Well, that's not exactly what's going on. In fact, the evidence suggests that the landscape is actually relatively young. How do we know that? For starters, there have been discoveries of marine rocks that are as young as 4 million years old. And these rocks were deposited at or below sea level, which tells us that the present-day landscape must be younger than that. Now, looking closely at the rocks, you'll notice something interesting. Much of the Central Coast Ranges comprises young, poorly consolidated, non-resistant sedimentary rocks. That's not exactly the kind of stuff you'd expect to see forming mountains, right? And yet, here we are. The only explanation is that the mountains are young and uplifted at a higher rate than the rapid pace of erosion. To see evidence of this recent uplift, visit the shoreline. You'll notice that the mountain landscape drops directly into the ocean, which is pretty impressive. Check out the Santa Cruz Mountains south of San Francisco, the Santa Lucia Mountains south of Monterey, or the San Luis Range west of San Luis Obispo for outstanding examples. And if you're interested, you can even look at the flight of five marine terraces in the Santa Cruz Mountains. The lowest terrace is about 100 feet above sea level, while the highest is 750 feet above sea level. Cosmogenic dating tells us that the lowest deck is about 65,000 years old, and the highest is about 226,000 years old. When we correlate the age and elevation of each terrace with sea level changes over the past 250,000 years, we can see that there's been a steady uplift rate of 4.3 inches per 100 years. That's slightly higher than present-day uplift rates. Still, it makes sense that uplift is episodic and often occurs during earthquakes. Plus, the tide gauge along Monterey Bay in Monterey tells us there's been a relative sea level rise of 5.8 inches per 100 years, consistent with geodetic studies that indicate active coastal uplift. However, the San Andreas Fault comprises a system of more than a dozen faults. These faults help to manage the movement between the North American and Pacific plates. The whole thing started about 30 million years ago, when a spreading ridge that separated the Pacific and Farallon plates intersected with the North American continental crust, right around where Los Angeles is now. Pretty cool. So, let's break down the San Andreas Fault System into three main sections, the Southern, Central, and Northern sections. Each section is unique due to fault geometry, activity, and seismicity differences. A whole bunch of sub-parallel faults in the southern section connects the Gulf of California to the continental crust. The southernmost faults are the Cerro Prieto, Laguna Salada, and Agua Blanca, which then expand northwest to other faults like the main San Andreas Fault, the San Jacinto Fault, and others. 
Now, the central section of the San Andreas Fault is relatively simple in terms of geometry, dominated mainly by motion on the San Andreas Fault and a bit of motion on the Hosgri San Gregorio offshore system. Interestingly, most of the fault's lip rate in the central San Andreas Fault is accommodated by a seismic creep, which sets it apart from other sections. Finally, the northern section of the San Andreas Fault comprises a series of sub-parallel strike slip faults that expand eastward from the main San Andreas Fault. You've got the Calaveras, Hayward, Rogers Creek, Makama Faults, and other lesser-known faults that extend northward toward the complex, faulting around the Mendocino Triple Junction. Scientists have closely monitored the fault and its surrounding areas for decades, studying its behavior and potential impact on the surrounding communities. They've used various techniques, from seismology to GPS and geological surveys, to better understand the fault's movements and the likelihood of earthquakes in the area. Despite their best efforts, predicting exactly when an earthquake will occur remains impossible. However, scientists have developed a much deeper understanding of the San Andreas Fault through their research. By studying the rocks on either side of the fault, they discovered that they've shifted relative to each other, which led to the development of the theory of plate tectonics. With the ongoing research and fault monitoring, scientists still do not understand much about the San Andreas Fault. The fault's behavior is incredibly complex, and predicting earthquakes remains difficult. However, the ongoing research and monitoring of the fault are critical for helping communities prepare for potential seismic events in the future. Technological advances have allowed scientists to study the San Andreas Fault in greater detail in recent years. By using drones and other advanced tools, researchers can get a more accurate picture of the fault and the surrounding areas. This research is critical for improving our understanding of the San Andreas Fault and helping to prepare for potential earthquakes in the future. So, what is this catastrophic event that's set to happen along the San Andreas Fault? The director of the Southern California Earthquake Center, Thomas Jordan, recently made an announcement that sent shivers down the spine of everyone that heard it. The San Andreas Fault system appears in a critical state and could produce a massive earthquake at any time now. While it's not exactly news that Californians live in a seismic hotspot, what's concerning is that the southern part of the fault looks like it's locked, loaded, and ready to go. Why do experts sound the alarm? Well, it's been over 160 years since the last major release of stresses in the southern part of the San Andreas Fault System. Simply put, the fault system marks the boundary between the Pacific and North American tectonic plates, and the plates are constantly moving in a northerly direction. However, the Pacific plate is moving faster, which means that stresses between the plates are building up over time. In the past, some of these stresses have been catastrophically released, like the 7.8 magnitude earthquake that hit the San Francisco Bay Area in 1906 and the 6.9 magnitude Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989. But these events occurred in the northern part of the state. The 1994 Northridge earthquake associated with a different fault system was the last major earthquake to hit the southern part of the state. This has led experts to suggest that a massive earthquake is imminent, and when it does happen, it'll be the big one. How big are we expecting the big one to be? Pop quiz, have you seen the disaster movie San Andreas? It depicts a massive earthquake with a magnitude of 9.0 hitting California, which is scary. While earthquakes of this size are not unheard of globally, they usually happen in regions where one tectonic plate is being forced below another, like Chile and Japan. The situation in California is different because two plates are sliding past each other. Now, before you start freaking out, it's important to remember that the movie San Andreas is pure fiction. But the San Andreas Fault is real and will likely generate a significant earthquake in the future. Experts predict that the maximum earthquake magnitude along the San Andreas Fault system will probably be around 8.0, with a 7% chance of such an event happening in Southern California soon. There's also a 75% chance of a magnitude 7.0 earthquake happening over the same period. While the difference in magnitude might not seem significant, the energy released by each event varies greatly. A magnitude 9.0 earthquake would release 32 times more energy than a magnitude 8.0, 
and 1,000 times more energy than a magnitude 7.0. Of course, there will be damage, whether it's a 7.0 or an 8.0. While California has stringent building codes, older buildings may not have seismic protection measures. There's always a risk for buildings located near known fault lines. However, it's important to note that the events depicted in the movie are unlikely to happen in real life. For example, the San Andreas Fault is not located beneath the ocean, so a massive tsunami would not be generated by slippage along the fault. Additionally, the plates are sliding relative to each other, not away from each other, so there wouldn't be a massive chasm opening up like in the movie. With all these figures, what are the estimated damage should it happen? So, the US Geological Survey wanted to understand what a large earthquake along the southern San Andreas Fault would look like. They created a model earthquake with a magnitude of 7.8 and slippage of 2 to 7 meters to represent the pressure buildup in the area since the last big event. They found that the most severe damage would occur to constructions that straddle the fault. Luckily, there aren't too many of those around, thanks to the 1972 Alquis Priolo Earthquake Fault Zoning Act. However, 966 roads, 90 fiber optic cables, 39 gas pipes, and 141 power lines still cross the fault zone. Overall, the cost of building damage was estimated at a whopping $33 billion, with older buildings being particularly vulnerable. Fires would also be a massive issue as gas mains and water pipes are severed. The damage from resulting fires is expected to be more costly than the damage from the initial shaking. The estimated death toll is 1,800. To make things worse, the earthquake could destabilize the region's tectonics and lead to a series of potentially powerful aftershocks. Just look at what happened in Christchurch, New Zealand in 2011. They experienced over 10,000 aftershocks. The big one is closer than we thought, and when it happens, it will be a big deal, and Southern California will be hugely impacted. Do you think we're as prepared as experts make it seem? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video, like it, share it with friends, and subscribe for more.